All right, welcome to episode 17 of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast. My name is Tim DeForest. Uh, the actual podcast will start in just a moment. I wanted to explain that this is part two of our discussion of the 2019 novel Tarzan, the Battle for Pellucidor by Wynne Scott Eckert. Uh, we did not originally intend this, uh, this podcast to be a two-parter, but we ended up talking about this wonderful book for quite a long time. So we have cut it into two parts after we finished recording. So that is why after you hear the introductory music, we will go right into the discussion of the book, beginning with chapter nine, um, without any preliminary introductions. So here is myself, Scott Stewart, and Jess Terrell, as we discuss the remaining two thirds of Tarzan Battle for Pellucidor. Dr. Scott, you were going to talk about chapters 9 through 16. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to make a note here. Uh, uh, I'm not going to do as much narration, but about uh, Eckert's uh, approach to the writing here. I mm -hmm. uh, want the audience to know that this book is not a pastiche. Um, and I have nothing against pastiches. I read a lot of them. <laughs> but it, he, he goes brings it up to a different level. He's not mimicking a Tarzan story or the way ERB writes. Um, he captures, if you want to call it, the atmosphere of an ERB story, but uh, it's very strong and progressive writing. Um, I noticed, uh, like we've talked about other books uh, ERB did, that Eckert here has uh, done where one chapter will be maybe with Tarzan, then one chapter with Suzanne. And we've commented on other books before where every other chapter or every third chapter characters come in. So we're continually getting updated kind of like in current time with what's going on as, as they uh, move through all that. And he uses a uh, um, uh, good, easy prose that, that moves forward. And I think that's important people to know that it's not um, um, yeah, that yeah. it stands as its own book in, in that writing because I know some people sometimes you hear people say oh that's just a takeoff or a pastiche or, or mm -hmm. whatever and um, he does a great job in writing this it's fun it moves quick and uh, it's very easy to understand what's going on there's a lot of and there's a lot of action mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. His writing, he's obviously influenced by Burroughs. I mean, I, Burroughs is obviously a huge influence on him, but he doesn't mimic, he doesn't try to deliberately mimic, mimic Burroughs' style. He, he is a skilled adventure writer in his own right, and so mm -hmm. his own style in writing is shining through here. So, uh, chap, anything, Jess, you wanted to say? Uh, no, no, you're right. Oh, okay. Um, so chapter nine is called Against the Garbuses. And in this part, uh, it's mainly concerned with Suzanne Korak's uh, daughter trying to escape across here. As uh, Jess was talking about, they're in this, uh, uh, like the Cavern and Chasms area. Um, she's trying to get through the cliff areas and move across. And as she's trying to escape or make way uh, across one uh, uh, chasm there, um, here come a group of Gorbuses, and uh, they're, they're up for a fight. <laughs> and uh, Lorden is on the other side, still with uh, uh, other, the uh, uh, Gilax over there. And uh, she does make it across and shows that <laughs> when it comes to fighting, she doesn't have to pay take a back seat to anybody because mm -hmm. she does does a uh, great job on it. I love the descriptions of how she's moving and, and takes out each person and the detail of her climbing and getting from one side of the chasm to the other. Really remind me if I'm remembering right at the Earth's core, the time they spend in the caverns there and climbing through. And, and the detail in that, uh, that is very much evoked here, I think. Um, uh, 
during this escape, uh, um, she tosses the ropes over to help uh, the others get across. And uh, also, Lorden ends up uh, being knocked unconscious. So she ends up carrying him out uh, to a safer place. And he wakes up from it and gets uh, very mad with her, which shocks her saying uh, she shouldn't intervene or shouldn't interfere with his life and what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Part of this we'll see comes from the fact of the male orientation, uh, the um, woman's submissive and uh, uh, let's say non-action or non-adventurous lives they live right within their villages as opposed to uh, being involved in something like this. Then it jumps to uh, Back to Nature, which is the uh, 10th chapter. This I like, this was a fun chapter. Um, uh, Tarzan's uh, left the airship uh, to try and uh, see if he can track down Suzanne. I uh, also thought it was interesting that, that um, when we were talking about influence of of uh, Merle's, there's a point here where we're talking about uh, uh, Tarzan trying to follow, pick out the spores of Suzanne. <laughs> and you think of made her <laughs> modern times or whatever, a grandfather sniffing around, <laughs> find out where his <laughs> granddaughter is. It kind of cracked me up a little bit, but it's appropriate for the scene and the action and what mm -hmm. Tarzan is doing, like animals would do, you know. <laughs> Uh, that was just kind of a bizarre image that went through my head there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, at one point, he gets a little uneasy about what's going on. As, as was mentioned earlier, um, uh, the fear of getting lost here, he, he's marked off a trail of where he's going to, so he can get back to the airship. And he drops out of the trees on, on this kind of route because he feels he needs to move a little faster. And when he does, he realizes, yeah, this is why he should have stayed up in the trees. Because um, he thought there was something down there, but he couldn't quite figure out what it was. And, uh, but he wanted to move forward faster this way. And when he hits the trail, he hears this uh, sort of <laughs> slithering, rumbling type uh, noise. And it's described here as, if I can. I got right here. A hybrid Ceratosaurus python. So it's uh, the main parts sort of like a, a front like dinosaur lizard with uh, feet and legs in which it's pulling itself forward, but its tail goes on a tremendously long ways and has the look of like the body of a python. So like I'm gonna think uh, Apatosaur or when I grew up Brontosaurus uh, had tails that were as long as the rest of their body. Uh, his description on this part, when he turns around, hears the noise and that thing rounds the corner, actually gave me the chills. I kind of went like, oh. Because <laughs> yeah. when he goes to attack them and you know, the thing with the stick or spear and mouth and what we've seen in many caveman things and stuff he's talking about doing this I'm like I don't want to be anywhere near this place <laughs> you know it just occurred to me I'm, I'm surprised I didn't catch it when I read it this creature might be a shout out to the original King Kong because <gasps> when Bruce Cabot's character Driscoll is hiding in a cave after the the rather the sailors have been knocked off the log there is a creature crawling up a vine at him that has a dinosaur head and four legs, but the back end of it is a, is is like a snake. Oh yeah, um, you know, and he cuts the vine to have it fall, and then goes back to trying to dodge Kong's hand. Um, but this might be it'd be interesting to ask the author that if it is a deliberate shout out to a similar creature uh, that was found on Skull Island. That one that one surprised me at all. Very, very uh, possibly could be. Yeah. That's a very that's a very good point. I could not find that this creature had already appeared in prior police reports. Yeah. Well, there is a uh, is it a Will Murray book the where Tarzan meets King Kong? 
Yes. Um, and I know that's not official canon, but it does imply that Skull Island and King Kong might exist within the official Tarzan universe. Yeah. You know, so I, you know, and I might be completely off base here, but that's that same creature, the way it's described here. So who knows? There, there are some similarities. And again, this is speculation on my part. There are some similarities with the way Caspac, Land of Time Forgotten, and Skull Island are described um, mm -hmm. with uh, hard to find, they seem to come and go, and they're surrounded by mist and they've got an impenetrable, surrounded by an impenetrable wall. Um, so, so I think there's some similarities there. That's a, that's a topic for another discussion. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good memory, good point there. That, that very well could be. Um, his, 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 his knowledge and, and background wouldn't surprise me at all. Over mm -hmm. there. Um, so he, he ends up fighting this thing and it's a monstrous huge thing. And suddenly this like giant guy, six and a half plus feet or whatever, drops uh, in on the uh, back of the uh, uh, creature and with an ax starts hacking away uh, at, at the tail end of it. And uh, Tarzan doesn't know who he is, but he'll be introduced uh, by the name of Trub. And he's like, again, six and a half feet tall, bigger than Tarzan, uh, wild blonde hair, and hacking away at the uh, tail on that. So while he's doing that, Tarzan more or less finishes off the head, um, uh, leaving it's dead now. And the uh, um, Trub manages to cut the tail away, but almost instantly, like when you hear about tails or <laughs> uh, limbs on uh, reptiles where they regrow, uh, it's like another uh, python grows out of the open, the cutaway part of the tail, becoming part of it to attack them. And together they manage to do enough damage to kill that. They, uh, they must have done really good damage because it Another one did come out of it, and the uh, uh, they they just want to get out of there. Um, I thought it was interesting too, if if you know, well, like reflexes with chickens too. But I've heard about it with snakes, where people thought they've got, killed a rattlesnake, but the movement, the reflex movement, which they they talk a little bit about the creature doing this here, people have still got bitten and poisoned by rattlesnakes or other snakes, uh, even a day later because they still have a reflex uh, movement in there. So I thought this adapted really well to that type of uh, danger on it. Um, they leave, they introduce each other and, and talk. And um, uh, Trub, uh, when he jumped out, jumped on onto the uh, creature, he goes, he goes, Tarzan. And then later on, he calls Tarzan again, help save me when the tail comes alive. And, uh, they're going to leave to go back to airship and uh, Tarzan's wondering how he knew his name because he doesn't know this guy and Tarzan says starts running back to get back to the airship and Trub's coming along he says uh, you can tell me how you know me <laughs> if you have enough breath <laughs> while we're running which he does uh, he knows um, other me members of the parties who've been down there in Pellucidor before uh, let me, I want to make sure I say the right couple because we got so many names here. Which, um, was it, uh, hmm. I know it wasn't, was it, uh, oh yeah, um, uh, yeah, David, Diane, and Abner hmm. uh, is told about them by his parents and they talked about uh, several times about Tarzan apes and and this is actually a young man, a young caveman, and he holds holds him in kind of hero worship. And as he said, when I saw you fighting what you're doing, there could be no other person than Tarzan. So then they get back uh, to to the uh, ship, and there they uh, talk about getting around, and navigating with or without compasses, and sort of what you you were talking about just earlier was uh, 
a lot of the technology that could be used isn't being used uh, by the people in Pellucidor because they don't feel any immediate need or certain gratification out of having it. So uh, any comments? Um, yeah. none, none that I can think of. Um, oh, I wanted to say with chapter nine, when Gordon and Suzanne, they've been bickering and they keep bickering. At this yeah. point, the way relationships work in the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe, you kind of predict <laughs> that these two are going to fall in love. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, I kind of jumped over that. But yeah, that, yeah. there's a little bickering and fighting going on. There. Yeah. And so that's 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 the process of falling in love most of the time in the uh, in the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe. Yeah. It doesn't, uh, work, it doesn't work that in real life. If they're bickering yeah. and fighting in my situation. In my experience, they don't want you around. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I don't think you would use this as a relationship guide for for real life. But it seems to work out okay for Burroughs characters. And, and also at the end of the chapter here, uh, Tarzan meets victory. Mm -hmm. and so everyone's starting to coalesce around around their area mm -hmm. and what they're going to do um, uh, uh, with the army that David uh, was leading and and the other mm -hmm. things. So now chapter 11, Lorden, of course, why that name means we jump back to Suzanne and Lorden again right there. And uh, the, like you're talking about the bickering and sniping and arguing goes back and forth and uh, um, it becomes obvious that uh, definitely he comes from a uh, male oriented uh, ruling society or whatever. Uh, women aren't supposed to do that stuff. And he, um, going back to his village, and uh, he doesn't really want anything to do with her, uh, but uh, she really wants to follow and go with him. Part of it, I suppose she's been alone and lost, so maybe this will be a way to help get out of there. He says, no, nah, you come with me, and you're just going to get killed. That's what we do to strangers. Yeah, but she convinces them to let her tag along. Along the way, they also come across this pit or crater. And there are creatures in there. They thought at first were the uh, Gilax. But when you got closer, they also had wings. They kind of rem I was wondering if this might be, when I'm reading this section, sounds to me like maybe an interbreeding of Gilax and the uh, Mayars. Because they describe, they look like they're in a ritual position, like, uh, head to toe making a triangle between three of them. Um, they're deteriorated quite a bit, obviously dead. And they've got uh, a form of wings on them. And I just kind of got that feeling, but they don't want to play with it too long. They're grossed out. I, I was thinking, because I'm presuming this is a indication of the overall story arc that's going to be running through these books. Yeah. I was thinking maybe they were Wiro who had somehow gotten uh, down or teleported into Pellucidor. Uh, because we know, I think, with the the story arc that's going to involve victory, uh, a lot of it hasn't unfolded yet, so we don't know. Yeah. But it, uh, there, there is, amongst other things, teleportation between different worlds and some connection between all these yeah. worlds. So they could be Wiro, but that's, that, uh, once again, that that's is. a guess. Well, that would tie a uh, I don't, don't want to jump ahead to the uh, uh, novelette at the end, but um, mm -hmm. uh, that would tie in with, like you said, the, uh, mm -hmm. teleportation or whatever these audio um, tunnels or whatever, how they're transported from one place to another. And, and uh, I could see these types crossing and ending up in Pellucid or vice versa. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. my, my thought was Wiru also uh, I, I, there was just a gut feeling based on the physical description I don't have anything yeah. else to, to base that on yeah. oh and just for so anybody who doesn't know those are uh, creatures from the Land of Time Forgot series so they are from sure. the lost continent of Caspak back up on the surface world um, and um, we did a uh, episode on Land of Time Forgot once so something else people can jump back and listen to yeah very good and uh, then they do get to the village there and, and as he kind of figured out probably what happened, Susan's taken prisoner. <laughs> uh, so then we go to chapter 12 
which is called Captured. And um, uh, they're going to go out and um, scouting around. Let me turn my book page over here. Yeah, it starts off from where Victory uh, meets Tarzan, and they're, they're talking uh, about friend and family relations and how they know each other and uh, where they're at and um, that she, uh, they go, why did you run away to follow David's army when she had disappeared? And uh, she said they were going after some Mayars. So it sounds like she has a very large curiosity factor. She's lived in a life and with family and friends in which she's known how to take care of herself, but seems, I don't know if you'd call it mischievous, maybe a little more reckless than Suzanne, Korak's daughter, in her approach to adventure, kind of like almost on a whim, as opposed to an intentional search. Does that make sense? I think it does. I think she's still very young. She's, what, a teenager here? Um, and I've my impression was the young, uh, um, young teens, so um, she that she would be impulsive at this point kind of makes sense. Yeah, I have I have described her as a little naive, and then the other thing that uh, and I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but while I have the floor, I'm, I'll mention it. My impression is that since she's younger, she has not lived through. Well, that may not be correct phrasing. But, but her perspective of the Mayhars is different than most people's. Most people live in Pluster. Most people live in Pluster have experienced the Mayhars firsthand and know the terror the Mayhars evoke and, the, mm -hmm. the, and maybe even have seen or are aware of, have heard about the Mayhars treatment of human beings. Uh, Victory is young enough and, and perhaps um, idealistic, maybe another word, uh, to... to uh, to not disregard the Mayhars as much as uh, the rest of humanity in Pluster does, or the most humans in Pluster does, that um, she may recognize that they have, and this is, again, this is my opinion, my opinion mm -hmm. and thoughts, and I'm not finding the right words, but may recognize they have, may have some redeeming qualities and should be listened to, or they may have something meaningful to say, um, which, is generally not the approach most people in, in Pluster are, are inclined to uh, shoot first and ask questions later, whereas Victory wants to listen to what the mayor has to say. I hope that makes sense. And, and that's, yeah, that makes perfect me. sense. I think that describes your attitude perfectly. So, the, uh, while they're checking on things, they come across the area where Suzanne had crashed with her uh, gyro, auto gyro, and, and um, uh, Tarzan's getting ready to go. <laughs> he has tracker spores again. <laughs> but then he finds out Dreschler has disappeared. And so he drops down and is able to catch up to him very fast and find him. Um, and at that time, they are then surrounded by what are called the bear men. They come up and are taken by him. He uh, uh, is ready to... Um, fight him. First, he tries talking to him because there's a word or two he recognizes, they say, compared to someone he had run into before up on the outer world. And um, so he says, you know, don't fight, uh, don't kill, we're friends. And they're like, no, you're strangers and you're not friends. And how do you know any of our words at all? So they're gearing up to fight him and Tarzan, uh, Kriega, and he's getting ready to just rip into him. And then steps back and sort of like, maybe we should allow them to take us and see what's going on and where we're going. So they are uh, taking uh, prisoners there and taking back um, to the uh, uh, Bearman camp <laughs> or caravan or wherever they're staying. Mm -hmm. um, that's chapter 12. I mean, there's a lot that goes on in chapter 12. I'm just trying to summarize it. Yeah. <clears throat> These creatures tie into, you. 
yeah, the Philip Jose Farmer novel that has been declared um, uh, canon, because that's where his encounter with bear men on the future in the in the um, in, in, on the surface took place. So it's referring back to that. Jess, I'm sorry, remind me of Farmer, the, the title of Farmer's novel. Tarzan, Dark Part of Time. Right, yes, thank you. And, yeah, and I'm very glad you mentioned that because I was going to, but I'm, I'm glad that you covered it. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Yeah, um, has there been any other Easter eggs, Jess, that you've seen that we've missed over the last few chapters? Good question, nothing that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. Nothing that I've noticed. Okay. That doesn't mean they're not there, it just means yeah. I didn't. And I have, I have been paying attention. I'm catching mm -hmm. my breath after talking for an hour and a half, but I, I, I haven't been paying attention. Um, and uh, I, I didn't, I haven't noticed anything. But good question, and 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 uh, do keep asking that question. So okay. So. Um, the other thing I want to say before we jump on is that Eckerd is now using the same uh, sort of uh, pattern that Burroughs often used, in that he ends a chapter at a cliff at a cliffhanger, and then. Yeah. Moves the next chapter moves to another character and might like resolve a cliffhanger they were in and then move their adventure on a little. And then it will cut back to Tarzan again in a later chapter. It's a very effective technique of keeping uh, suspense high in a book that Burroughs used successfully any number of times. And so it's neat to see Eckert uh, following that same pattern and doing so, so effectively. Well said, it's always a good rule yeah. of thumb for writing and Burroughs definitely did it when Scott mm -hmm. Eckert's doing it here is, is uh, the chapter should tell us, either tell us more about a character, character development, or it should advance the plot. If you can do both, that's a that's win-win. A mm -hmm. And and and, and, and uh, you always want, the, always want the reader to turn the page. So the cliffhanger, always want them to go on to the next chapter. That's why when you sit down and read for 20 minutes at night and three hours later, you're still reading in the middle, <laughs> mm -hmm. in the middle of the early morning hours, that's a good book. It is. And in a similar vein, the chapters here are not extra long. They're shorter. They, you know, cut to the chase. They tell that part of the story and then leave you holding and jump on to the next part. And that's what keeps it moving. You know, like you said, you're like, okay, I got only two more chapters in, uh, two more pages in a chapter. I can do that. Uh -huh. And then you read the first paragraph and next chapter. I said, well, better. Better see what happens this one. It's not going to take very long. It's only four, five, six pages. <laughs> you read that and <laughs> you just keep repeating it. <laughs> exactly. This is an excellent book. If I haven't said that, I need to say it. this is an excellent book. And yeah, a couple of chapters a little short. Certainly the chapters that I was talking about, there's a couple there that were kind of short. But every chapter is packed with information. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting information, good information. As I said, that it, it develops the character or moves the story along or provides provides more information. It does something that's beneficial to the reader and keeps them uh, interested and keep and keeps them motivated and keeps them wrapped up in the story. Um, and, and as you can, as you saw from my comments, there's a lot of information because I there's several chapters where I talked quite a bit. Go ahead. Yeah, there's yeah, yeah exactly, and uh, I mean. They should make a movie and just take my life savings, take my money. Because <laughs> this one, like we said before, Nazis, dinosaurs, mm -hmm. Tarzan. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, we, we, appreciate, we appreciate your donation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay, so in number 13 goes back to Suzanne, and she's with. Um, uh, uh, Lorden's people who are the bus star rider people in their village and she's prisoner there. It appears that Lorden is getting a little softer in the way he talks or treats her there and it is revealed that um, I'm sure he's holding part of this against her was back in chapter eight uh, uh, the bus uh, the uh, um, bus star that Lorden has she had killed so, you know, it's sort of like you killed Lassie or <laughs> my friend Flick or something like that. You're going to be a little upset with the person. The demise of Flipper. Yeah. He killed yeah. Trigger. That's... <laughs> yes. Yes. And um, his father also thinks Suzanne would make an interesting mate. So that may keep her alive for a while. Uh, she's allowed to work after a while with the women in the village, and um, 
you know, join them for meals and the food, kind of sees what layout of everything's going on and uh, watching the bus stars and how they work and uh, uh, train with them. Kind of reminds me when I'm thinking like dragons and um, I just had the name name on uh, my tongue. But when uh, it's not how to train your dragon. It's a, uh, like dragon. Aragon, the book dragon Aragon. Right. Okay. Where, where you kind of share souls or yourselves uh, in the training and growth of them. But uh, there's one Gilak there uh, who's named Brandon, <coughs> excuse me. And he's the type of person who would kick your dog or his dog. And he treats his buzzdar the same way. And she thinks that's disgusting. The buzzdar's name is Spike. Key and spiky, <laughs> but I think uh, that's it. Um, and she starts, I guess, probably sneaking over there where, when people aren't paying attention and, and feed Spidey, uh, spiky, Spidey, wrong universe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, spiky and, and petting them, and just uh, they're both uh, having this friend relationship like with your best dog or best cat or whatever uh, uh, animal you may have horse or, uh, or otherwise and then she uh, um, gets him ready one night and flies out of the village to escape to get out of there let's see here um, and uh, okay yeah um, I was almost going to jump to the next chapter but she uh, flies a ways away and then uh, finds that probably they should rest a little bit. Uh, he, the uh, uh, spiky, uh, goes down where there's some water, a lake below this cave to drink, and, and she's inside the cave. And after not too long, she notices some movement, someone out there. It turns out to be uh, Lorden. And she's like, okay, he's gonna capture me. You're gonna take me back or whatever like that. And uh, he says, no, I, I let you get away. I want you to get away and, and get away from there. And also, um, uh, what was it? Um, oh yeah, this is it. This is another thing about the male and female thing. Uh, he says, women, he goes, women don't ride bus stars. She goes, I did. He says, no, you, you can't. You're not supposed to. You don't. So you can't. He says, I know you did. <laughs> she goes, yeah. And I, I wrote them. We can do things like that. Again, this is something we've talked about Burl's doing and, and Eckhart's doing the same here to, to the right advantage to, to a good cause is the respect of women being strong. They, they don't run three feet and trip over the vine and need to be helped up. We saw Suzanne fighting earlier and, and uh, uh, we know uh, Victory gets involved in stuff and gets out there. Or wait, this is Suzanne. What am I thinking? I mean, we, we saw her fighting earlier and now we see her uh, uh, riding, riding this uh, creature. And, um, you know, he didn't... Uh, he, he, I think he probably had more men who were weak than he did women in a lot of his stories um, to make them the villain and so on. Uh, and she's going to get ready to leave, but uh, Lorden says the weather is changing. There's going to be a bad storm. Don't leave yet. Comments? Um, well, I wanted to say the way she gets uh, Spikey to, um, to bond with her is by treating Spikey with kindness and compassion as opposed yeah. to the way Bandor was mistreating uh, the beast. And that's a common theme again in Burroughs novels is you often have uh, Burroughs protagonists uh, um, be getting these really cool pets, whether it's Woola the Callet on Mars or David Innes's Hyenodon um, or whatever, that they, uh, by treating them with kindness, they earn their love and their loyalty. Um, and they have a cool pet who's a companion and 
can help keep them alive. Um, and we see that again here with uh, Suzanne and Spikey um, using the same technique to get this, the, this bus star, this flying beast, to bond with her. Yeah, exactly. Um, chapter 14 is called Victory's Curiosity. Uh, that storm does blow through the area and the airship is out in it and takes a little damage uh, and ends up being blown off off course. Uh, they end up uh, uh, landing or deplaning or whatever you want to call it uh, near a uh, Mayhar city uh, that's been damaged either along with the storm or long-term wounds. And um, then they, they come under attack by Sagaths, another type of tribe people there also riding buzz stars and um, of course they're defeated and this is where you're talking about victory earlier about um, maybe as a teenager the uh, uh, idealism because she doesn't like the violent part the fighting she doesn't think the Sagaths the uh, uh, attackers the enemy should be killed he doesn't like that idea at all. So that'll be interesting to see some of her other adventures, her take on, on some of this. Uh, so they uh, start making repairs on the airship. And then um, again, she ventures out without anyone knowing it <laughs> to go and explore the Mayar city that they landed close by. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Oh, just Victory's an interesting character. She's definitely naive, and I think in some cases overly naive. You know, the Saigas were attacking. There was no choice but to defend for the O2220 to defend itself. But, you know, she does actually is presented as having a point in the end when she says, you know, there are situations where you can talk to the Mayhers and learn from them, and we should take advantage of that. Um, so, yeah, I'd be interested too in the later, her later adventures uh, when she's bopping around the universe, mm -hmm. uh, how she handles the threat of violence. Um, yeah. Because yeah. certainly she's like probably the only protagonist in the Burroughs universe who would object to killing someone in self-defense. Yeah. So yeah. it would be, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that's handled within her character. Does she that's, lose her naive decay or does she stay true to her, um, her own views or what? Isn't, isn't this the part of the story, and remind me if I'm wrong, um, where Victory poses the question that um, that uh, how do we know that wasn't the welcoming committee? Um, oh. <laughs> I think she does, although she is being a little naive about that. Right, I, I, I agree with that. But yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it's a question we we have not seen much mm -hmm. before. Yes, uh, so, so which always drives drives me the question of gee whiz, who shot first? Mm -hmm. or, or, or because you, if it is a welcoming committee, you don't want to be aggressive against them. So I yeah. think it's an interesting perspective that's a little, um, re, it's, it's refre I don't want to say refreshing, but it's a different perspective for a Burroughs novel, yeah. uh, which does, I think, is, is challenging to the reader and, and makes everyone, everyone think. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And, um, and I re oh, I realized, by the way, and I don't want to get into it right now, but I realized I missed a, um, I did miss a um, Easter egg, which I'll I'll, talk, I'll save it for just when we're done with this, so towards the end. So, oh, you can I, put that in if you want. Well, all right, since you asked, <laughs> um, the Kavuru elixir. Uh, this was discussed over in the chapter entitled "Captured," which was chapter twelve, and I meant to talk about this. Uh, Tarzan's longevity, uh, as as we know, th there are possibly two ways that Tarzan has gained longevity. In Tarzan and the Foreign Legion, he discusses a um, witch doctor ritual that he went through at an early age, probably during the Jungle Tales era. Uh, lasted about a month. It was gruesome. He kind of regretted doing it. But uh, later on in life, he could look in the mirror. Of course, he's got his scars from his battles. He can help that. But you can look in the mirror and see that he's still fairly young looking. Uh, and other people see he's still fairly young looking. So he had this wish doctor treatment, which may have given him some longevity. Now, that's different from being invulnerable. 
And that's different from being immortal. It simply means if you if you mind your P's and Q's and careful how you live, you could live an incredibly long life. And I do mean long life. Yeah. So that's one source of it. The other source is the possibility of the Kavuru uh, elixir, uh, as described in Tarzan's quest. So here in um, chapter, where I said the chapter entitled "Captured," that topic is addressed, and Tarzan discusses that the original Kavuru elixir described in Tarzan's quest was made involving some, uh, it required the death of uh, young girls, which of course is uh, totally contrary to anything any Burroughs hero would do. Um, um, so the question was, and, and at the very end of the book, there's a group of about five people, which includes Tarzan and Jane, and it is believed or the, the, leader, the readers left to wonder as to who all takes this, the, the surviving Kavuru uh, elixir that, that they've, at the end of the venture, they still have some of this stuff. Uh, and is it ethically sound for Tarzan to partake of that or for Jane to partake of it? Well, the only one we really, really know for sure is Nakima. Nakima's involved and he played the part in this adventure. So it is believed that he, um, that he uh, took the Kavuru elixir and I believe that Tarzan even references that he is still alive. I believe that's mentioned in Tarzan's Foreign Legion. Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, that was that's what I thought. Um, but the question: Did Tarzan take it? We don't know. We don't. We don't really know for sure. We think he might have, but we don't know for sure. Well, in 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 this uh, in this book, in the chapter entitled "Captured," it is clarified that uh, the uh, Kavuru elixir has been synthetically recreated so you don't have to kill young girls anymore in order to create it and Tarzan's family has taken this synthetic Kavuru elixir they have taken it and they are they are are blessed now with a uh, longevity um, and uh, but at some point they're going to have to people are going to start saying start asking questions about how they managed to live so long so they'll have to hide that in some some way so I just I just wanted to mention that that was something that uh, that was something that um, has been clarified in this book for ERB Cat. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all. Yeah, I I'm believe glad it also, did because. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say it also kind of give them a way for making Korak and Miriam and the other members of the family immortal as well. Yes. Yeah. And and that's that's longevity, not not true immortality. I mean, they mm -hmm. they could die at some point. Um, but that was, uh, we're talking about Easter eggs. That was something I was aware of and meant to talk about. And I'll let that chapter get right by me. So thanks for letting me butt in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I have. Okay. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought it up because that was, I was going to mention that in my notes. And I, I, uh, I forgot to because one of the other things I could see this setting up when Tarzan's musing about uh, what you said uh, will people recognize him and his family? don't age the same that other humans do, right. uh, that maybe Pellucidor would be a good place for them all to live. And I thought that would be a great setup or foreshadowing, whatever you want to call it, in the future, where maybe Tarzan and Korak and, and the family members do go to Pellucidor because for future books and for future movies or TV shows, they could be in Pellucidor and do the adventures they do without worrying about it being a, a, a dichotomy or, or, you know, a contradiction or whatever in the modern world uh, with, um, you know, internet and modern planes and helicopters and weapons, all that, but also escape the things that are pointed out in some of the old books and, and in the last movie in Legend of Tarzan where people said, oh, it's the great white god of the forest saving the natives again or whatever. Uh, and Pellucidor, they're not part of our world here. So maybe, maybe that would give an out to continue keeping those adventures, but without bringing in the uh, politically sensitive side of some of those issues. Mm -hmm. Um, now we do know, we do know since Tarzan and the Valley of Gold, uh, the novelization is now considered canon. Um, we do know that Tarzan, even if he moves to Pellucidor, does pop up back to the surface in the early 1960s to have that. Yeah. Event. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, they so, could still go back and forth, obviously, yeah. you know, with the airships or through the, uh, they don't need the iron mole, they can go up through the hole through the uh, mm -hmm. Arctic there and, and travel back and forth that way. They might be able to use that matter transfer device that um, oh, yeah. um, I mentioned from um, the book Mayhars of Wooster too. Mm -hmm. If that book is canonized, which remains to be seen. And referring now into chapter 15, uh, which is called Bear People of Pellucidar, Tarzan again thinks about, recognizes the similarity between here and Pelodon. So when you're talking about the creatures that Suzanne saw and, and uh, Lorden saw in the crater, yeah, you know, if he's making that connection, I'm sure we got some other adventures coming up where these two lost worlds are going to cross paths in some way. Mm -hmm. So that, that's part of in 15 where he thinks about that and notices uh, the similarities. Uh, um, during their captivity, uh, Dreschler is being Dreschler and thinks they're pigs or whatever. He, he does wants nothing to do with these people except to get out of there and get away. And Tarzan continues to try and talk with and find a common bar on both so they won't be killed or whatever else he's he's up for making allies not not enemies and um then towards the end of the chapter there uh he hears a noise off in the distance and and some of the village warriors have uh, already got out there he recognizes it being uh, machine gun fire and so he goes out there and and uh uh, uh Starts with a B, Bandar, ba um, <laughs> uh, the one ba uh, bear person he talks the most with, uh, tells him just to stay back. He's, and he's like, no, I know who these people are, their weapons. You don't have a chance against them. I know how to take them out. I know who they are. So he does go out there and he ends up uh, taking out about half a dozen Nazis and they're riding on dinosaurs and carrying machine guns and shooting with them. And uh, when he gets done taking the Nazis out of action, the bear people have a, seem to have a whole new respect for him. <laughs> they're kind of jaw dropped and like, whoa, what did this guy just do? <laughs> so that, um, that is my favorite action scene in this book. And it's full of great action scenes. But Tarzan fighting, you know, Schmeiser toting Nazis on dinosaurs is, yeah. is just wonderful. What a movie poster. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a great idea. I like that. Mm -hmm. So then um, I'll roll over into 16 here, which is called the, uh, uh, the Bird R uh, Riders. And, um, and we're back to Suzanne and Lorden again. And Lorden convinces her to... Um, come back to the village and she says, oh, I'll be arrested or uh, put up or your father will take me or uh, Brandon, the guy who had the uh, uh, Bardar, the um, uh, had uh, uh, sp uh, spiky. spiky, I keep wanting to say spiky, uh, <laughs> spiky um, and she doesn't want to deal with him and, and he's seen her fight and he's like, you know what? I don't think you're going to have a problem taking Brandon out. <laughs> So he finally convinces her to go back. And so she's returning of her own free will, which kind of uh, surprises the uh, uh, village that she would do it that way. And so uh, as is his right, Brandon, you know, wants to fight her, uh, have a duel with her, kill her, what, whatever for stealing is, uh, for stealing uh, Spikey. Well, she does a couple of rounds on him and uh, does a couple more rounds on him. And then it's like, oh, he should be out by now, which he really is because he staggers a little bit and then drops to the ground, knocked out. And the village can't believe that either, but they're mightily impressed. And the chief releases her from any claim he would have her for his mate or princess or queen. And, uh, she is now being held in good stead by uh, Lord and his father and the uh, rest of the village. And that 
wraps up that section for you, Tim. Yeah, I'm just going to say those last two chapters, 15 and 16, had a nice parallel to it. In both cases, either Tarzan or Suzanne is being held prisoner by a tribe that's initially hostile to them. And in both yeah. cases, yeah. they managed to earn the respect and friendship of those tribes. So like granddad, like granddaughter, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that is a so, good, it is a good parallel mm -hmm. story. And, and they're both great, fun, well-written action sequences yeah. too. And they do mention, I can't remember if it's in this chapter or other places, that Suzanne, aside from being trained by Tarzan and Korak growing up, she's also had, you know, judo training as an agent, as an allied agent against the Nazis. So yeah. her ability to fight does not come out of left field. It actually makes perfect sense for her. Yeah. So Emma Peel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she could have <laughs> been Emma Peel. Uh, maybe her daughter uh, will maybe. grow up to be Emma. So uh, we we could get into a whole new thing about the world Newton uh, universe. Yeah. <laughs> we'll save that for another day. Mm -hmm. uh, Jess, were there any Easter eggs there that you recognized? Uh, nothing I'm aware of, but I appreciate you asking. Okay. Well, chapter 17, the underground city, this goes back to victory. So now we have like Tarzan stories, Suzanne stories, and victory stories. We have three <clears> characters <throat> separated from the O220 and the rest of the the rest of the group. Um she goes to search this apparently deserted Mayher city. Um, and she meets a Jalak, which is a hyena don. Just picture a nine foot long, weird looking wolf, um, which are generally dangerous creatures, but this one is tame and it seems to be friendly to her. And there's no explanation for that in the book. So I'm wondering if this again, foreshadows stuff that's going to be happening to Victory later on. Um, you know, uh, if what she does involves time travel, maybe she's befriended this already and doesn't know it. So, uh, but that's just, that's a wild theory. I have no idea. Um, and Jansen, uh, uh, Jay, uh, you know, Jason Gridley's uh, son has followed her in. It was obvious from the chapter, a few chapters earlier when they met that he instantly struck with puppy dog love. Um, so he follows her in to, uh, and they end up teaming up. And uh, then a Segoff arrives. They're, they're generally very violent, but this one just signals them to follow him. Um, so all sorts of weird stuff is going on in the city, but what it is, we will have to wait a few minutes because uh, we're moving on to a new chapter and moving on <laughs> back to Tarzan and Dreschler. Um, any comments from you guys on that chapter? No. Regarding that hyena, Don, I am reminded, uh, Raja was the name of the animal, that David Ennis, mm -hmm. back in the early Pellucidor books, uh, had a, um, a, a, no, I bet it was a pet jaylock. That's what it was. Yeah, well, they, probably, are, they are hyena dogs. They are hyena, okay, thank you. Um, and he said, it said the dog was well fed, so that made me wonder if it was, if it belonged to somebody. Now, yeah, okay. I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that it's David Ennis's, but mm -hmm. David Ennis's uh, J Lock did have a female friend, um, and I don't recall offhand what happened to her. So that that's something I would need to look into. Okay, well, those are all possibilities. Uh, but the 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 J the tame J Lock is unexplained, I believe, throughout this book. So mm -hmm. it may be planting a seed for something, or it may just be that she happened to meet a tame J Lock. Right. I think, I think yeah. my opinion is it means something that the, yeah. either we've seen this animal before or we're going to see it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a very good point that you brought up there, but I can't mm -hmm. contribute anymore right now to yeah. the identity of this creature. Okay. Now, chapter 18, Shades of Opar. Now, Tarzan, remember, had gone out to recapture Dressler, uh, and uh, uh, they were, they've been released by the bear people who agree to team up with David's army. So we'll see the bear people again near the end of the book when David's army approaches the lost city. Um, then they're escorted to this city, which by the way is called Interus Thule. And Tarzan, this is like a really fascinating part. Tarzan notice, notices similarity in architecture to the ruins at Opar. And he wonders yeah. about a connection, you know? Um, is this the civilization that originally beat the, built the city a part of the same civilization that built Opar and then, you know, reverted back into, you know, the ape men that populate that, that city. There's, there is a similarity. Um, and, you know, Opar was supposed to be a remnant of Atlantis and the Nazis were looking for 
technology from Old Atlanta. So there's all these connections here, which are not confirmed in this book, but once again, I believe are probably setting up that, that um, um, you know, that eternity story arc that's going to be going through several of the novels. Um, now well, here- they also, uh, you know, at the very beginning talk about uh, uh, Nazis being down there to look for uh, yeah. ancient technology from Atlantis. So mm -hmm. there, there's a whole lot of possibilities of stories and, and yeah. uh, uh, fantastical cultures mixing mm -hmm. it up here. Yep. Uh, now here, uh, you know, I was mentioning early how smart a fighter is and how good a, tech, a, a Tarzan is and how good a tactician he is. Here, I can't help but think he makes a mistake when he decides to sneak into the city with Dreschler on his own rather than, you know, waiting for the O220. Um, the, uh, if I want to back, if I want to armchair General Tarzan, um, I'm not sure he made the right decision here. Uh, so they attempt to sneak in, they have to swim a moat and Tarzan is attacked by a sea scorpion while this is happening. There's another cool fight scene. I really have to compliment uh, Win Scott Eckert on his skill in creating uh, a fun, unique, exciting fight scene. Because this one, he's, he's underwater fighting the sea scorpion that's, killed, that's, crap, that's grabbed him. Uh, he does kill it, get loose, but he and Dreschler are taken prisoner. They're taken prisoner by natives but of the city, but when they're brought to the throne room, there's an SS officer named Schrader uh, sitting on the throne by, by the native queen Yaria. Um, but it's soon obvious that Schrader is in charge and he's pretty contempt contemptuous of Yaria. And it's obvious that he is um, uh, calling the shots. Uh, now Yarla is dressed very similarly to the way Law of Opar dresses. So in addition to the architecture, there's that as well. Um, we find out that the native name of the city is Yu Pran. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Um, we learned that, actually we learned what Dreschler's deal was the whole time. He just pretended to defect, but, and then he was using the allies to, to get to Pellucidor and contact Schrader because Schrader himself had not contacted the outside world in a long time. Um, now the Nazis here in Pellucidor had been using a ancient piece of technology that allowed small objects to be teleported and they were sending messages that way, but that had broken down and their plane had crashed. Um, Schrader had made alliance with some Mayhers and he's looking for a device that will link with them and magnify their telepathy to mind control the world. So Schrader is basically the heck with the rest of the Nazis. I'm gonna find this you know, mind control helmet and I'm gonna take over the world on my own. You know, um, uh, never mind Hitler, never mind Himmler. I'm taking charge. So the guy's not only a Nazi, he's even incapable of being loyal to other Nazis. Um, he really is, he's, he's the main bad guy of the book, um, we find out at this point, and he's contemptible in every way. Uh, he's even been killing off the other Germans who came with him. Um, and I assume the Germans who were out on patrol on dinosaurs were, were going to get theirs occasionally, eventually, you know, going to get theirs eventually as well, but just didn't know it yet. Um, but he's no longer, you know, like I said, he's no longer interested in helping Hitler. He wants to take over the world on his own. Um, and he's got Yarla completely cowed and the other natives, the native guards are obeying him. And he orders that Tarzan and Jalesha would be taken to the Mayhar pits and fed to them. And Yarla though, wonders if Tarzan is the god Tazan as he resembles a statue of Tazan and it's prophesied that he would free the beast men slaves that are kept by the city. Uh, there'll be more details on that in later chapters, but uh, that's you know a weird, if it is a coincidence, it's a weird coincidence to both the similarity in name and the fact that he looks like this statue. And um, is this the chapter where they refer to a statue from one of the animated episodes? Or is that the, later on? Yes, yeah, this is it. And there is an animated episode with this with the statue of Tarzan and the Kima on his shoulder mm. uh, that uh, the tar Tarzan visits. Okay, and so there's like just a, a something they cherry picked from the excellent animated series, Saturday Morning Enemy Series, and made canon as well. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, Schrader also decides it's time to get rid of Yaria and he orders her taken to the major pit as well. Uh, that's chapter 18, any comments from you guys? I was going to say when they started talking about 
Opar and uh, and mentions the uh, statue of the god to Zion. Mm. I, I couldn't help, my mind automatically went to Philip Jose Farmer's book, Time's Last Gift, which is mm. maybe my favorite book by him. But that, and uh, then you go and read the other uh, ancient Opar stories. Uh, I don't know, they might, they might have some major plotting going on here for mm. a number of novels uh, it's just making me curious. <laughs> yeah, they may grab other older, not older classic novels and make them canon, like uh, a farmer's Opar books. So, I, it's possible. There, there's been, there's been, you know, your point is well taken, and I've wondered that myself. But I certainly have not heard any rumors to that to that effect. Mm -hmm. okay. They're going to, they might. I mean, I understand your, believe me, I understand your points, mm -hmm. but uh, I've not heard anything on, on those. But okay. I don't know everything either. I listen to a lot of rumors. Okay. Um, chapter 19 is entitled uh, Matriarch of Mintra. Because um, Mintra, it turns out, is the name of the city that Vickrey and Jansen are in. And that Sagoth that said, follow me, or single follow me earlier, brings them to a Mehar. And um, we're going to find out that the Mehar is named Tu El Sa. And she was the Mehar that David Innes brought to the surface without meaning to at the end of um, ah. um, uh, uh, Athier's core, brought back in the book Pellucidor and then showed mercy and spared her. And she later spared him when he was a, when, when he was a prisoner. So, um, you know, that, that, mer that act of mercy by him paid off for David, but she's ticked off now because she sees David as repaying her for that by destroying uh, the city of Futra, the city that, of Mayhurst that David destroyed with his empire. Uh, David did that in complete self-defense, you know, but um, she's not happy with, um, with, uh, with David. Um, and she still has, uh, you know, I, a kind of a not entirely admirable attitude towards humans. It's like, yes, I realize you guys are sentient, but I still may consider you uh, cattle and might have you for lunch today. Um, but she is able to communicate telepathically with Victory. And Victory is fascinated when she's studying the stone and clay tablets there with Mayhar scientific secrets. You know, she recognizes this as valuable stuff that can, that can help everybody enormously. And I think this helps solidify her ideas that we need to make friends with Mayhars rather than just kill them automatically. Um, so, so a lot of character development going on there for, for victory and um, important information that we find out that I think will apply more overtly to later books in the series. But um, it, it, has, it has an impact in this story as well as we'll see when we get to the end. Uh, cha that's chapter 19. Um, once again, any comments before I move on? No, N nothing here. Okay, now I love the the, the name of chapter 20, the title of chapter 20 is Food for Thought, which um, I love that title <laughs> because the Mayhars are freezing people with their tele telepathy and eating them. They're eating the remaining Germans who came with Schrader. He's just done with them. Um, Tarzan is, is kept frozen by their mental powers and can only watch. Now, when Yarla, the queen, is set into the pool, um, the mayors are distracted from eating her when they see in her thoughts that she knows where that mind control helmet is located. And they pass that information on to Trader via telepathy. And Trader is now going to have access to this helmet, which can get, get, let him literally mind control the entire world. This is not good news. But that distraction also allows Tarzan to break free of their control. You know, he grabs Yarla and they escape into a tunnel. Um, Schrader orders guards to just find and kill him immediately. And Dreschler and the rest of the Nazis are eaten by the Mayhars. And Tarzan is just indifferent to that. You know, they, they're Nazis, they're not nice people. He's perfectly happy to let them get devoured. Um, he learns from Yarla about the god Tazan. And while well, Yarla's is still wondering if he is literally that god, he wonders about that coincidence in name. And he wonders if that also connects to Opar in some ways, or if it's connected to that other statue. He just, he's got, he's processing all this and coming up with reasonable theories, but he doesn't have enough information to know. Um, Yarla does tell him that there's a legend that her people came from elsewhere, 
but there's no details known. So her people could have been Atlanteans who came from the surface world through the North Pole entrance. Um, meanwhile, Schrader does find that mind control helmet. And Yarla and uh, Tarzan find their way out of the city via the tunnels. They see David's armies approaching and they see the Bustar riders, uh, though does, Tarzan doesn't know yet who they are. They're arriving as well. But the Bustar riders swoop in to attack the army. And that is because both they and the army are being mind controlled by Schrader now. Um, so chapter 20 ends with two sets of allies being forced to attack each other. Um, once again, any comments? No, you covered that pretty good. Okay. No, nothing for me. Okay. And chapter 21 is a, just a bit of a flashback to Suzanne and the writers flying to the city uh, to rejoin the army. It's a, it's a short chapter, but it's important. When they arrive, her mind goes blank and she leads an attack on David's army. So Tarzan's granddaughter, along with all his other, just about almost all his other allies are now being mind controlled by a Nazi and forced to uh, fight one another. Um, a short but important chapter. Any, any comments? No. Okay. And chapter 22, an emerald, an emerald consciousness. Uh, you know, Schrader and the Mayhers now have control of the army and the writers. And they intend to have them fight one another to the death. Um, and also both Schrader and the Mayers are planning on eventually double crossing each other. But for the moment, they have to work together. Um, as we get to the end here, I think uh, Eckert is purposely making the chapters a little bit shorter to jump from one point to the other in a more fast paced, exciting way. Because that's another important but relatively short chapter. Um, in chapter 23, the Battle of Yupran is Tarzan's watching the battle begin. And he realized that the army will probably win, but only after suffering heavy casualties. They don't have any good anti-aircraft weaponry. Uh, when a Bustar rider attacks him, it uh, when it attacks Tarzan, he drives that rider off, but he sees it's Suzanne. He sees it's its own um, uh, granddaughter. Um, and Yarla realizes this means that Schrader's found the helmet and it's mind controlling everybody. And Tarzan also realizes this must be true. That's the only explanation for his granddaughter trying to kill him. Um, I do think it's important to note that he does drive her off so Suzanne is a superb fighter and probably better than 99% in the, of people in the world, but Tarzan is still at the top of the fight, who can fight best food chain here. Um, Tarzan has to get the Schrader quickly to stop this, um, uh, but the soldiers, um, are, you know, the, 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 the native soldiers in the city are loyal to Schrader rather than Yarla. So he's gotta do some sneaking around uh, through the tunnels to try and get to Schrader. Along the way, he's attacked to a beast, by a beast man, an Oparian beast man, a beast man from Opar, uh, who dies in the fight. So there's another mystery that's not addressed in this novel. It's setting up future storylines. Somebody from Opar is in Pellucidor, um, and Tarzan has no idea why, um, and can't question the guy because unfortunately he dies in the fight. Uh, but he's, he doesn't have time to concentrate on that mystery now. He sneaks to the throne room, kills the guard at the doors, and enters. Schrader tries to mind control him, but it doesn't work on Tarzan. And here's another connection to the no this, this one to the novel Tarzan the Magnificent, where there was in, uh, in that book an emerald called the Emerald of Zuli, which could be used to mind control people, but it didn't work on Tarzan. And so this is obviously the same material or the same technology or whatever, and, it, and that doesn't work on him either. Um, he doesn't know why, but for whatever reason, he can't be mind controlled. Um, Tarzan chokes, chokes Schrader unconscious. He smashes the helmet. And when more guards arrive, he has Schrader bound and he convinces the guards that it's time to switch their loyalty back to Yarla. Um, and they made, the guards make the wise decision of agreeing, agreeing with that. Then he takes Schrader to the Mayhars and gives, uh, you know, feeds them to the Mayhars, which is ruthless, but I think perfectly in keeping with uh, how Tarzan deals with truly evil men. Um, any comments so far? Uh, no. 
Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it comes up with uh, chapter 24, The Quality of Mercy. Uh, the, the, the adventure is effectively over, but we do have some loose ends to tie up. Everybody's reunited aboard the O220. Uh, Tarzan reaffirms that the helmet is similar to the diamond he encountered in Africa, which is now hidden on his estate. And I believe that's going to play a role in the, uh, the later storyline as well. Plans are made to kill the Mayars, but Victory convinces them to make peace with them uh, using her ability to communicate with them. Uh, you know, David is convinced, David Ennis is convinced to, to go along with this only after learning that the Mayher Victory had met was uh, was uh, two all saw the one who who's, who spared his life at one point. Um, Tarzan returns to Upran to gather up the remains of the helmet, but Yarla says she's already thrown them into the sea. But we're we're already seeing reasons not to necessarily believe Yarla, so we don't know for sure if she's actually done that or not. Uh, Tarzan has no choice but to accept her word, and Yarla is relieved that Tarzan is leaving because if he is the god Tarzan then he's prophesied to free the beast men slaves that are kept on a nearby island and she doesn't want to lose her slaves. And this is just a guess on my part, but because we saw the Opar beast man earlier, I'm presuming that she has somehow has our Oparian men as slaves on this island. Um, but once again, that's a plot thread left for a future novel. Um, the Mayhers agree to return to Mintra where the, where the, uh, the Mayher that victory spoke with is located. And with that, a message of peace. So we have at least a tentative peace between the Mayhars and the humans of Pellucidor. Um, you know, D David and, and Jason are both proud of victory for arranging this, although they're both uncertain that the peace of the May with Mayhars is practical. Um, Tarzan talks for a while about the similarities between Upran and Opar, and talks about uh, the idea that the tree of time, which is from mentioned in the farmer novel, might be involved somehow. So they are slowly connecting all these lost worlds and plot elements from different parts of the uh, Burroughs universe into one like sort of a unified field theory, if we can borrow a term from Einstein. But for now, there's unsolved mysteries. You know, Victory wants to return to the surface to study physics and astrophysics and, in order to get a better lock on Mayhair science. Jason and his family are gonna move permanently to Pellucidor. Victory's planet's uh, parents show up and the father tells her she has to have certain symbols tattooed on her arm before leaving. Um, and Victory asks Jansen to take care of her new pet Jalik while she's gone. Um, and then chapter 25 wraps the novel up. It's called Bonded. We find out that Dion the Beautiful has a daughter. Uh, Suzanne tells Tarzan that she's bonded with Spikey in a way that she can't understand, but she opts to stay in Pellucidor. And it seems that she and Lorden will eventually get married after he opts to come with her to, to Siri. And Tarzan hopes that her decision to say will eventually convince the rest of his family to relocate to Pellucidor ahead. Because he knows that, you know, um, Africa is changing and pretty soon it's just not going to be a home for him anymore. So Pellucidor is indeed a, a good place for the Tarzan family to be living. And that's the rest of the novel. Any more comments from you guys or Jess, any more <laughs> Easter eggs I may have missed? Uh, no Easter eggs that I'm aware of. I've been looking for that um, Filmation episode and I have not identified that. I'm pretty sure it's in the first season of Filmation, but uh, I'll look further for it. Okay, well, we're planning a future episode where we do commentary on a couple of those episodes. That might be a fun one to do. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, Scott, any final comments on the novel? Uh, I kind of want to be careful about what I say about it here, but um, yeah, Jess mentioned at the beginning, they have something, you know, the quantum interlude mm -hmm. in the back of these novels. So uh, when they mentioned the, uh, uh, about the helmet, mind mm -hmm. control helmet and uh, uh, the emerald, it's interesting. <laughs> if you look at the very end of the interlude in this book. Yeah, the, uh, that's there's kind of this short story or perhaps it's novella length at the end of this that we opted not to discuss in detail because it's part of a continuing storyline that's still unfolding. But, the quantum yeah. interlude is the uh, two-page two item that I mentioned. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Getting them mixed up. 
But we are, yeah. we have consciously decided not to talk about the novella in it, which is a great short story. I recommend it too, by Mike, yeah. Mike Wolfler, wasn't it? Am I saying yeah. his name right? Yeah. Yes. And um, uh, we're not going to discuss it because it is just one part of, of, uh, of a story arc that began with, I believe, a novella or short story at the end of the, uh, the Venus novel. Um, and we'll have story on, and there's a Victory Harbin novel scheduled to be coming out soon. So I assume a lot of this, a lot of these plot threads that are left out there are going to be tied up in that storyline, that they're, they're just setting up Victory's adventures. There's also a Barsoom novel uh, for the um, ERB universe that'll be out before the Victory novel. Oh, okay. Uh, that Barsoom novel is to be written by Gary Gravel, and I ought to know the title of it. I want to say, I'll, I better not say it unless I get it straight. <laughs> but um, it, I know it's, going to be, it's to be written by Gary Gravel. It um, probably is about two months. I shouldn't even say that. It has not been, uh, there's no timeline on it just yet. So I shouldn't. Okay. Okay. And we are, by the way, we are recording this in the latter part of February, 2021 for anybody listening in the far future. Um, so um, yeah. Okay. And I think, you know, we've all said how much we love this novel. It's a great adventure story. I personally, I personally have no problem considering it a part of my view of the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe. Um, I think yeah. it fits in with the Tars, with the Burroughs universe quite well. And I enjoy the way they are making connections between the various aspects of that universe. Um, but once again, that's something, you know, if you're a Burroughs fan, you'll almost certainly enjoy this. But every fan can make his own decision about it is his personal canon in his head whether or not this is a definite part of it. Um, it but in either case, you will enjoy it on its own as a great, uh, a great adventure novel. Or hopefully have enjoyed it. If you didn't take our, our advice about reading it first, we've just spoiled the entire novel for you. <laughs> I, I, would, I would suggest go ahead and read it. Anyhow, it's still a good yeah. book. Even yeah, it's still, it really is good. And there would be stuff we didn't cover and uh, we talked about how cool the fight scenes are, but you know, you read them yourself, you find that out <clears> on your own. So yes, read it anyway. The uh, Barsoom novel is by Gary Gravel that's forthcoming sometime in 2021, that's this year, mm -hmm. is uh, entitled John Carter of Mars, Gods of the Forgotten. Okay. Now didn't, I, am I remembering, it's been a long time since I read the last book in the of the original Mars series. Didn't it end with John Carter and Dejah Thoris trapped on Jupiter. The skeleton men of Mars. Yeah. That's my recollection, yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wonder if one of the new universe stories will get them off of Jupiter and back home again. I've, I can't speak to that. I have not heard yeah. anything in that regard. Mm -hmm. That would be fun, though, if they finally covered that. Yeah. J j j just like the uh, speculation earlier, I've, I, I can't speak to that one either. Yeah. So. So, oh, okay. and then the Victory Harbin novel, which is slated for uh, late this year, is entitled Victory Harbin Fires of Halos. Okay. This be written by Christopher Balkary. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know, so far, it's just I really do enjoy the fact that the current people involved in Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated obviously love the source material and respect it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, um, uh, that shows in the new fiction that they are that they have issued over the last few years, uh, including the the Wild Adventure of Tarzan books and things like that. They're all whether or not they're canon, they're all entertaining stories and they are respectful of the source material and they capture uh, the Burroughs characters I think accurately. Right, I would certainly give this uh, Tarzan Battle for Blooster my highest recommendation. I urge everyone everyone to sit down and enjoy it just relax and enjoy the story it's it's mm -hmm. a good one a lot of stuff packed in there mm -hmm. so um okay any last comments before we bring it all to an end yeah except it's a fun book yeah, yeah totally right mm -hmm. okay we have actually tentatively planned future episodes i don't know when we'll record them yet but we were going to do the mad king um which is um, uh, just uh, uh, one of Burroughs's, I think probably lesser known novels, but it's a fun one. And following that, we were planning on uh, doing a commentary episode, doing commentary on a couple of the animated episodes from the 
1980 or a roughly 1980 uh, Saturday morning cartoon, which was one of the best television versions, most accurate television versions of Tarzan ever produced. Filmation. Uh, yep. And then we were thinking of doing uh, the Savage, uh, the Eternal Savage, or the also called the Eternal Lover, which I'm embarrassed by saying that title, but there you go. Um, uh, uh, after that, because that has a tie-in with the uh, Mad King. So though that is our tentative plan for the next three regular episodes. As I said, we were we recording this in late February 2021, and I will be soon posting a more or less weekly mini podcast doing a chapter by chapter analysis of a princess of Mars. Uh, so those of people who may have enjoyed what the, my analysis of Tarzan, there's Tarzan of the Apes, there's more of that coming. Uh, please leave comments for us. Let us know how you think we're doing and what Burroughs material you might think you might enjoy seeing us cover in the future. And um, once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Uh, my blog is Comics, Old Time Radio, and Other Cool Stuff. And there's a link there to my Amazon.com author page so you can buy all my books and make me wealthy. Um, <laughs> Jess and Scott, anything you guys want to plug before we... Just thank you for, for a good evening again. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll plug one more time. This book, Tarzan Battle for Pluster by mm -hmm. Wynn Scott Eckert and the entire ERB Universe line of books and the associated uh, related comics coming from American mythology for the ERB Universe. And I think we live in very special and exciting times. So I encourage every Burroughs fan and all the new fans you can, you can commandeer to come and enjoy these fine stories. Yep. And you'll find me at Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, Facebook discussion group for love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs with Lola Pop. Okay. Um, so uh, once again, thank you everybody for listening and we will be back with more fresh material soon.